This Swift structure represents a single vertex with the position and color fields. The shader code declares a similar structure. Note that the fields types and order must match what we declared on the Swift side. This restriction can be lifted with vertex descriptors. Let's take a look. Like before, we have the same struct on the Swift side, the vertex array, and the vertex buffer with the data from the array. What is new is this vertex descriptor object. It contains an array of attributes, where we use the attribute at index 0 to represent the position from our structure, and the attribute at 1 to represent the color. Note that the format matches the type of each field. The buffer index of each attribute is set to 0. This is useful for getting different vertex attributes from different buffers. In our case, we use a single buffer with interleaved data. The offset is where things get interesting. I've noticed that people often get this part wrong, so it's worth taking another look. Here's how our vertices array is laid out in the memory. Each vertex occupies the same number of bytes. Note that the alignment doesn't have to be as pictured here, because the system can introduce padding for performance reasons. In any case, the offsets of the attributes are relative to the vertex start. So the position's offset is always zero, because the position is at the beginning of each vertex. But how do you calculate the point in the memory where position ends and color starts? You might have seen people using the size or stride of their previous attribute, but this doesn't always work. Sometimes Swift can pad our structures to ensure proper data alignment. I will illustrate this with an example shortly. For now, trust me that the correct way to do it is to use the offset by function. The index in the layout array refers to the buffer index. We are using only one buffer, so we need to specify the layout for the index 0. We set the stride to the stride of the vertex structure. That's how Metal knows how to get to the next vertex after all the attributes are processed. The shader code also requires changes. Let's take a look. First, the vertex structure needs attribute annotations. Then the vertex main function. Instead of an array and an index, we only need a vertex. Thanks to the stage in annotation, the Metal pipeline will prepare the vertex instance according to our vertex descriptor for each call of this function. This vertex object is also used in the return statement. And here's the complete shader code. Lastly, we have to set the vertex descriptor in the pipeline, and then we are ready to run the app. And here's our triangle, just like with buffers. With vertex attributes, we no longer have to match the Swift and Metal structures exactly. For example, we can change the order of the vertex struct in the shader, and the system will still correctly match the fields thanks to the attribute annotations. We can even mismatch the types. Here we use the float4 types in the shader to simplify the vertex main function. Our code still works, even though the fields in the Swift structure remain unchanged. Float2 for the position and float3 for the color. Metal automatically sets the Z coordinate to 0 and W to 1 when mapping from smaller to larger vectors. We can even go crazy and switch from a float2 vector to two separate floats for the X and Y coordinates. This is quite unusual, but it will help us to see the problems with vertex offsets. Our vertex descriptor still correctly maps the structure defined in the shader, so it's all good, but check this out. Our color attribute starts after the two floats describing the position, so you might think that the color's offset is simply two floats. You see this code everywhere. People assume you jump over the previous fields to get to the correct offset. In most cases, they use vectors of three or four floats, which have the same stride, and this approach works. This case is different. See what happens when we run the app. The colors are all wrong. This is because even though the two floats take up eight bytes in the memory, the color attribute starts after byte 16 due to padding. With our offset being too small, we interpret the zeros in the padding as the actual color data. 
Changing this back to offset off fixes the problem. Last not but least, indexing. This is a standard way to reduce our vertex buffer's memory footprint. Like in this example where we render a square. It consists of two triangles. Usually we'd have to use six vertices to describe them. Instead, we use only four and refer to them in our indices array. The first triangle consists of vertices 0, 1 and 2. Vertices 3, 0 and 2 make up the second triangle. We create the vertex buffer just like before. The new thing here is the index buffer. We create it in a similar fashion using the correct data type to calculate the buffer size. The rest of the code is the same until we get to the drawing command. We replace the draw primitives call with draw indexed primitives, providing our index buffer as a parameter. And that's it for this tutorial. I hope you enjoyed it and I will see you in the next one.